Hi, and welcome to another episode of Moby Pod. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Moby. Hi, Bagel. Hi, Moby. <laughs> and today we'll be talking with Dr. Kirsten Thompson. And I am so fascinated by her and her story. Lindsay, will you tell us a little bit about, well, also, ah, okay, we'll give you a little bit of background on Dr. Kirsten Thompson, but then I'd really like for her to tell everyone about herself. She will go into great depth about these things, but just to prepare you the listener. Uh, Kirsten Thompson is a wonderful person, but in addition to that, she's a board certified psychiatrist who works in California. And she also has started, I mean, she's done lots of different things. She worked for JP Morgan Chase. She was a surgeon, but now she's working as a psychiatrist. And she also has a company called Remedy. Remedy Psychiatry, right? Mm -hmm. which is a kind of more accessible online uh, psychiatry for the state of California. But she's also yeah. working on lots of other ways to make psychiatry and mental health more accessible. And she's a wonderful, fun person, lady, And I have wife, about mom. 500 questions about different therapeutic modalities and her story. I mean, I'm obsessed with the brain and how it works and the fact that so many people are struggling and suffering and many people are underserved or unhelped. So if you're listening and you're struggling with anxiety or depression or other issues, I hope that there's something that we talk about that will be of benefit to you. I'm saying you, well, I'm looking at you, Lindsay, when I say you, because I'm hoping it'll be ben of benefit to you, but also to the people who are listening. Yes, if you will learn a lot about Kirsten, but we'll also get a lot of information about what to do if you are worried about accessibility to care and also just the care itself and what it might be like and what it may entail for you. Okay, I'll also ask her about lobotomies, <laughs> which I so, will be embarrassed about, but I still will do it. So without further ado, let's bring in Dr. Kirsten Thompson. Hi, Kirsten. Hi, Lindsay. Because we're all very curious about how someone goes into your field, I think it would make a lot of sense for you to kind of tell us where you're from and how you got into this career. Um, Start at the beginning, if you can. <laughs> I was just going to say, the do you want the you short born, answer? Or the, birth the, yeah, or the, the long answer. Yeah, where, where you were born, uh, when you were born, how you were born. Astrological child, child going right Childhood. In there. <laughs> um, rosebud moments, anything. <laughs> okay, because I have a short answer. But so the the longer answer is, you know, the, the, the phrase that always comes to mind is physician heal thyself, right? So I'm a psychiatrist. And I don't think everyone I know goes into mental health field for some very personal reason, I would say, and myself included. So I'm originally from upstate New York. Whereabouts? Rochester. Mm -hmm. um, my dad worked for Kodak for 30 years. My, um, my parents got divorced when I was a year and a half old. So I grew up sort of going, shuttling back and forth from both homes. And both parents were in Rochester? Both parents were in Rochester at the time and for for all of my growing up years. You know, I'm, you know, I think having divorced parents was was hard, not on the grand scale of trauma and lifetime hard, but hard enough for me. Um, and then my mom remarried when I was like four and had a baby sister who died when I was five years old. Oh. And that was such a sort of palpable grief moment. I, I wow. mean, I still have visions from when that happened. And it really, I really was looking forward to having a sister. And that was probably my first sort of like big trauma. And sort of the moment I also realized like my family had no language around death or grief or depression or mental health. And it was just mm -hmm. on the record, no one in my family had any mental health issues. So nothing was discussed really in depth, um, including, you know, I think the depression that my mom went through and had to start medication for. Mm -hmm. I had no idea at the time. Um, so I kind of proceeded with growing up and, you know, went to high school, went to college, and then um, always loved math and science, was pre-med in college. Where did you go to school? Cornell. Mm -hmm. And so really loved math and science, but was from upstate New York, so was sort of wowed by the internet boom in the late 90s. And so <laughs> took a job on Wall Street at J.P. Morgan when I was 21. And my first day of work was actually September 11th of 2001. Oh, my God. So You're kidding. <laughs> that's sort of a very, like... <laughs> 
your first day, like putting on your sneakers, getting on the six train, going down to Wall Street was on September 11th? Yes. Yes. How is that even possible? Except I was wearing like three inch heels and I was in like a power suit, or so I thought when I was 21. Okay, I, I was I was imagining, I was thinking of like Melanie Griffith and Working Girl with like this, or like you wear your sneakers on the subway, but you have your fancy shoes and your, your bag. little roll up. I've never, flats, I've never yeah. had a real job, so I don't know how anything works. I, I only know about these things from TV. Yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, I was, I was in my suit and it was um, 8 a.m. and we were on the 30th floor of this one Chase Manhattan Plaza building. Um, Chase had just bought J.P. Morgan. So we were sort of like one block away. There was a block between us and the oh World Trade God. Center. That was probably like the second major trauma of my life. And, you know, at the moment when it happened, you know, now it sort of falls into this chronology of events where like first plane and then second plane. And then we knew it was sort of a terrorist attack. But at the time, it was just total chaos. And so we had to walk down 30 flights of stairs. And rather than going far away, um, my boss at the time said, let's go to the Wall Street building, which was one block away. <laughs> and we thought we were kind of safe. And so we sort of proceeded to try to have the meeting again when the buildings fell. And we were in this building called 60 Wall Street, which has, it's sort of a glass atrium on the ground level. So you can see glass Mm -hmm. on both sides. And so as they fell, we just saw people screaming and running on both sides of the building. And then this like sort of huge cloud of debris passing. And so all of us inside the atrium didn't know what was going on and just started running and screaming and running in circles because there was literally nowhere to go. And I remember this like very sentinel moment for me, which was looking to this to my right. And there was like a man with his briefcase just clutching it. And I just thought to myself, oh, my God, I'm going to die. And this is where I'm going to die with. And if I was him and I was 60 and all I had done was to work in finance for my whole life, I'd be really disappointed with my life. Mm -hmm. And so, like, luckily, everything sort of calmed down, and we sat down and, you Oh, mask where, where you were living at the time? So I was living in Hell's Kitchen, mm-hmm. um, 45th and 9th, and it was a long walk back to that apartment, <laughs> although very unifying for all New Yorkers who were kind of there at the time. Yeah, I was on Mott Street between House and Prince. Okay, okay, yeah. So it was a really intense time, and I— I think I, I didn't know anything about PTSD then, but and I just think to I jump in around that, what well, one of the things that was especially, and I don't know what your perspective is on this as just an individual who lives through it, but also as a clinician, is the PTSD we didn't think we were allowed to have. Mm-hmm. Like after September 11th, like I mean, clearly it was very traumatizing, but I was fine. Mm-hmm. And, like, everywhere you went, you remember those fences that were just covered with pictures of people? Like, have you seen this person? Have you seen this person? And, like, you felt like you were adjacent to real grief. Mm -hmm. Like, I I felt like I was, like, all these people had died, and I didn't feel entitled to my own trauma. I was like, sure, it was rough, but I was like, I didn't die. I don't know anyone who died. And also, at that point, I was drinking and doing tons of drugs. I'm sober now, but, like... It's just so interesting when you have that, like, adjacent trauma that you don't feel entitled to. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you had any experience like that. Yeah, it's almost as though it was normalized in New York at the time. Everyone experienced it. So if you experienced it, too, you weren't necessarily allowed to kind of suffer. And to my knowledge, all the people I knew didn't really do anything. It wasn't viewed as trauma because it was sort of this collective experience, meaning nobody I knew got therapy at the time or discussed it as though it was a trauma. And I could tell it was just sort of different. So my boss, sort of speaking of, wanted to have a meeting like the next day and was like, let's just go to a different building. And I was like, no, I am I am not OK, which for me, who tends yeah. to sort of be a people pleasing person in general, mm-hmm. was like very hard to do. So, I mean, eventually I went back to my Wall Street career, and I, but I definitely had nightmares about plane crashes and being in planes that crashed. But I didn't necessarily put it together that that was sort of elements of PTSD mm-hmm. until many years later. And so I think that was really hard for me. But it was also good. So it also changed the trajectory of my life because I decided I didn't want to do finance. You didn't want to be the 60-year-old guy clutching his briefcase on death's door. No, (laughs) no. And, you know, that's kind of where I was headed. I was in this sort of analyst track program. It just didn't feel like what I wanted to do. So I sort of actually kept that program and job for a while because I was supporting myself. But I started volunteering at night in the hospitals of New York, doing different programs. So I did a program for women with HIV who are getting their GED. I did a program where I volunteered at Mount Sinai Hospital. 
hospital as the lowest person on the totem pole who would sort of clean bedpans and feed patients, which many people think would, you know, probably be gruesome. But I really loved the sort of caretaking aspect and Mm -hmm. realized that I really loved medicine, which is something I loved when I was a, a kid, but kind of came back to that. Prior to that, I had sort of said to myself, like, it's too hard going to medical school and I'm too old. I'm in my 20s already. And sort of all of that went out the window. So I went back to, well, I had to take pre-med classes. So when I was um, three years into my Wall Street career, I went back to Columbia and take took pre-med classes in order to be able to apply to medical school. And then I went back to medical school when I was old at 26. I'm saying (laughs) old in quotes because it felt old at the time. And where did you go to medical school? I went to medical school at SUNY Downstate, which is in Brooklyn. Okay. I went to SUNY Purchase. Oh, yes. 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 SUNY alums. Yeah. Yeah. Considering there are about 800 SUNY (laughs) campuses. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, uh, you know, anything to bring it back to me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Went back to medical school and that was a really good experience. It was a um, sort of a program that had a lot of people who were underserved um, and also an academic hospital. So you'd learn sort of complex things, but also be serving people that really needed help and did medical school there and started my medical. This is a very, very long answer to your no, question. That's great. So no, this is amazing. Feel, feel free to cut this me is, off. This is what I was personally hoping for. <laughs> feel free to cut me off at any point. Um, I, you know, probably for a variety of personal reasons, maybe one of which is kind of often I am driven to sort of do the hardest thing and the most accomplished thing. And that kind of probably goes back to family dynamics that I grew up in with and my role. And it's not always a bad thing, but that is sort of a long way of saying I ended up going into surgery. So we did medical school and then came out here to Los Angeles to be a surgeon. So I ranked the USC surgery program as my first choice because they had a really incredible program with two female transplant surgeons. And, you know, transplant surgery is one of the most intense types of surgery because you have to be willing to operate at any moment for 14 hours to replace like an entire organ, sometimes longer. And so I was sort of inspired by the nature of a program that was at the time progressive enough to have two female transplant surgeons. And so you became a surgeon. So I became a, well, I was training, yes, as a a resident in in a general surgery program. So I was operating for two years doing surgery at LA County Hospital here in Los Angeles. I liked the program because it was both a county hospital, again, where it was serving the underserved, but also an academic hospital where you'd learn very complex um, cases. And I loved the nature of the people, but I realized pretty soon into surgery that I wasn't the best fit for surgery. And I say that for several reasons. One was that it was all encompassing. So I was working, you know, there was a law that you were only supposed to work 80 hours a week, but we would routinely work 100 hours a week. And, you know, I wouldn't sleep every three nights because I was on call. And I thought I could sustain that for training, but I realized sort of shortly into that career that even after training, it's a sort of incredibly intense lifestyle. And I wanted a little bit more of a broad-based lifestyle for myself. So I'd come in and be like, hey, did anybody see this movie? And everyone would sort of like scout at me like what you you know you're not supposed to see movies and I wasn't the type one of my colleagues was so into surgery that he would come in we worked six days a week and he would sort of come in on his seventh day just to observe surgery and that's amazing that's exactly what you want in your surgeon but that wasn't necessarily the life that I wanted to just be doing kind of surgery all the time so it wasn't a fit for me in that regard And the other reason I sort of found surgery to not be a fit was because I was more interested, the more I sort of got into patient care, I was much more interested in people's emotional experience of the world and their life. Um, So on more than one occasion, you know, we had a lot of trauma victims at the LA County Hospital, and a lot of it was due to gang violence. And so, you know, we would have, and this happened, two kids in one night were stabbed in the heart at parties, presumably over over gang violence. And as a surgeon, I was sort of meant to sort of like help operate. And then at the moment, someone's sort of no longer alive. There's no point in sort of spending time there anymore. You want to go save the next person, of course, which makes sense. But I was sort of really hit with the poignancy of like an 18-year-old kid, one of which was wearing like Christmas um, sort of themed boxers Oof. that night. Um, and I, you know, felt the need to kind of stand there and hold this person's hand who was dying completely alone in an operating room. And to me, that was really meaningful and emotional. And 
I wanted to sort of be with this person as opposed to kind of, you know, running to the next operating room. And so, and I was wondering, like, you know, why did this happen? Why is this poor kid in a gang? Why are people joining gangs? Like, where is their community? What, you know, sort of all the sort of thoughts behind what what goes into that decision, I guess. And just the extreme grief that this sort of family would feel. So I was definitely like an odd duck, to say the least, in surgery. Um, and I started kind of reaching out to friends who had gone into psychiatry. And I also had started my own therapy, actually, not until I was 30. And that sort of opened up this new planet that was like, wow, feelings. And what, what kind of therapy did you do? You know, it was, it was still when I was in New York in medical school. And I th- it was a social worker. I honestly think she just did sort of a general psychodynamic, what I would call psychodynamic. So it wasn't CBT. It wasn't, I didn't even know anything about it. So if she did have a type of therapy at the time, I had no idea what so like it was. like dynamic psychoanalysis or... Yeah, probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah, probably. And she wasn't like a, you know, strong analyst. It was very much about like processing. And it probably was mostly like a supportive psychotherapy because I had had no mm-hmm. exposure to anything mental health in my life. <laughs> and I was 30. So I think at that point, you know, just kind of processing what was going on. And at the time, and this wasn't even going deep into my sort of childhood. It was just kind of like relationships and that sort of thing mm-hmm. at the time, mm-hmm. medical school. And with surgeons, I have a few. I have a few friends who are surgeons, and I I can't imagine what that's like as your job, cutting people open and working in an environment that's just filled with blood. Literally, what's that like? The first time you make an incision, the first time you're holding the scalpel and you cut someone open. Do you remember where what that was like and how you felt? Yeah, I mean, I I don't remember the very first time, quite honestly, but I do remember the sort of recurring sensation or feeling that I had. And it, you know, it really did feel powerful. And I, I say that not in a controlling other people kind of powerful way, but sort of a meaningful and poignant and the honor of being able to do that felt really extreme. And it was also scary. So, you know, obviously making, and there were times where people People would make an error and you're literally either killing someone or almost killing them. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, you know, it entails tremendous responsibility um, in a very like immediate term way as well, which I think is very different than me- mental health. Now as a psychiatrist, it's things progress slower as well. But surgery, you know, has to be so exact all the time. Otherwise, people, you know, really can die. Yeah, an old friend of mine is a brain surgeon. And I just can't, no pun intended, I can't wrap my head around that. Like that his, but, and he's, for him, it's the most normal thing in the world. Like I wake up, I go in my studio, I work on music. He wakes up, he goes to his hospital and he cuts people's heads open and tinkers with their brains with a knife or a laser. And how, I, I can't, again, I can't make sense of that. I'm glad that people do it. I'm glad that he knows how to do it and he's so good at it. But that's his daily life is like covered in blood and brains. Um, One fascinating thing he told me, and I don't know if you ever had this experience, is when he's cutting people open, he can immediately tell who the cigarette smokers are. He said because their skin falls open. Like it doesn't have like it doesn't have the sort of like collagen or like uh, like a healthy young person. He'll cut them open. You have to like push their Mm -hmm. skin apart. And he said with the smokers, it just kind of like falls apart like wet, wet newspaper. That's so gross. Yeah. <laughs> really, if you, if, so really if anyone's gross. ever thinking of quitting smoking or not starting smoking, that's a very good reason is that you don't want to have your skin have the consistency of wet newspaper. <laughs> um, so, Kirsten, so you're in this your trauma surgery moment where you're with this guy and you have this realization of, I don't know if this is, if I want to be doing this exactly. Maybe I want to deal with more of like the emotional side of healing seems to be this moment that you had, right? Yeah. So then what did you do after that? So I did a lot of soul searching. And what I mean by that is I I, I talked to my, I don't know if it was my husband then, boyfriend, husband at the time. And, you know, I was like, I'm really not happy in this. And this is sort of like a probably a semi-negative character trait of myself. But I was like, I can't quit. I just can't. Like, I'm not a quitter. And by the way, nobody ever quits surgery. And this is, it's such a privilege to be in this role because a lot of people can't get those residency spots. There's only a few and they're limited in the country and blah, blah. Nobody ever quits surgery. And he was kind of like, I'm sure people quit. It's sort of when (laughs) someone says something and you realize like, oh, 
why have I been so narrow-minded about Mm -hmm. this? So I ended up just sort of talking to people. And lo and behold, people quit all the time and go into different types of medicine. And so I started talking to friends from medical school who had gone into psychiatry. And I did that because I had worked in psychiatry at Columbia and research when I was doing the pre-medical program. And I really loved, I felt like my people were there. Mm -hmm. And so I had loved that job. So I sort of reached out to people who were training and, and they all were so happy and they really loved kind of the mental health field and were really interested in it. And it seemed like something I could do. And as my own therapy was kind of opening up to um, in my life, it's, it was just open this vast world that I felt like there was so much to learn. And that was an important thing to me too, is, you know, on some level, I want to be kind of learning my whole life. And I felt like I could be like a crusty 95-year-old psychiatrist, like still learning and still loving talking to people and each new person and hearing their story. Versus surgery was was on some level, to me, a little bit um, mundane and repetitive. And, you know, if you become a super specialist, you're kind of doing a lot of the same surgery, but looking for anatomical differences. But your goal is to really be solid and repetitive, whereas mental health is just so vast. Um, it seemed really exciting. So I, I quit the I actually applied to psychiatry residency programs in Los Angeles because I was already here and loved it. And I got a couple of spots and went to UCLA where I finished psychiatry training three years, so two years of surgery in psychiatry. And I really just loved it. Um, Just so much to learn. I really knew nothing, even though I'd gone to medical school, knew nothing about sort of mental health. But um, really loved working in psychiatry and tried to kind of experience every type of mental health care system that we had in the U.S., which is really possible in Los Angeles, which, which has been really great. So one question I have, about 15 years ago, I got really excited. I was going on a date with a psychiatrist. And during, because I was like, you know, granted, we only had one date because she was a pretty seriously mentally ill drug addict. But, uh, <laughs> and I say that as someone who used to be a pretty seriously <laughs> mentally ill drug addict. But on the date, like before the date, I was so excited because I was like, oh, even if the date's terrible, like we can talk about different like modalities and like who are her, does she like Young? Does she like Viktor Frankl? Like who's she inspired by? She didn't know anything about therapy. She'd never been in therapy. She knew how to write prescriptions. And I was like, what do you mean? I was like, you're a psychiatrist. She was like, yeah, I, I'm a doctor and I know how to write prescriptions. And I was so taken mm-hmm. aback by that because I assumed that psychiatrists were psychologists who knew how to write prescriptions. Mm-hmm. And she had no background in talk therapy or any type of non-pharmacological modality. Mm-hmm. And is that just her? Or are there a lot of psychiatrists who are just like, they write scripts and that's it? Well, I think, you know, I can't speak to every psychiatrist or program in the nation. And I'm not maligning psychiatry. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad it exists. And, and, and it sounds like what you're describing is diametrically opposed to how she approached things. Like yeah. like I said, she just, she talked to people, she wrote prescriptions, that's it. Yeah, well, and there certainly to this day are psychiatrists who, you know, choose to do 100% medication management is what we call it, where they are writing scripts and sometimes do 10-minute visits to check in and that's sort of the way they practice and their focus. And and I would say, though, the the breadth of psychiatry is, is vast. So some psychiatrists end up doing only talk therapy or a certain type or modality of talk therapy mm-hmm. now because they love it so much or they find it to be so effective. And then there's kind of everything in between. I think the types of therapy have all also evolved and improved so much in the last 10 to 20 years. So, you know, before it would be you would either learn about medication, of which there were a few medications, or you were an analyst, right? That was sort of the traditional type of therapy. And then in the last 20, 30 years, so many different types of therapy have evolved and have been shown to be effective, like cognitive behavioral therapy and so many others that I think now there's so much more to learn and and specialize in. Because when I was growing up, my understanding to what you're saying was that, like, psychologists picked a lane and they stayed in it. Like they were a Jungian or they were a Freudian. And that was kind of it. Like, the, the, you know, the Woody Allen approach to therapy is like you go to analysis five times a week for 40 years. So my assumption growing up was that it was quite siloed in a way that, the, you know, the therapists studied one approach and that was it. And I was When I started going to therapy as an adult, and Lindsay, I don't know if you had this experience or not, but I was really happily surprised to find that the therapists I was seeing were sort of multidisciplinarians. Mm -hmm. Like they were interested 
in CBT. Mm -hmm. They were also interested in dynamic psychoanalysis. They were interested in Jungian archetypes. They're interested in all these different things. So my question is, is the standard now to be multidisciplinary in, in that way as opposed to exclusively siloed in one modality? So as a psychiatrist, and I'll speak to sort of the training and in residency, which is four years, and, you know, I just, well, I didn't just, sorry, years ago, graduated from UCLA, <laughs> feel very young still, um, and I'm, I'm still on volunteer clinical faculty there, so I have a bunch of mentees and um, teach a residency class and was teaching med student classes, so I've sort of watched their curriculum evolve, and if anything, it's been, you know, far more in-depth on the therapy front. So, you know, whereas on the medication front, we haven't had a lot of new players in the last 20 years as far as new medications that have come out and been shown to be wildly more effective than the old medication. And therefore, a lot of the innovation in the learning has been on the therapy front. So for sure, the UCLA program has a really hmm. robust training program in things like CBT um, or this cognitive. This within psychiatry. So, within okay. psychiatry, yeah. And all different types of modalities of therapy specifically. And there's a lot of support around that too, not only classes and clinics, but having supervision from you know, sort of therapists who are very experienced in the field. So it's very, very therapy intensive. And a lot of psychiatrists do want to specialize and do mostly therapy as opposed to medication. So it's really sort of individualized. Hmm. Um, but the programs themselves are very much trying to, at least UCLA for sure, trying to expose doctors to much more of the therapy side instead of just doing medication. Great. That's amazing. I feel like I'm monopolizing things. Lindsay, well, what do you have? I have a question because I have done this many times and I just wonder what you do when it happens. Not many times. I did it recently where because of the internet <laughs> and because of social media, I would assume that often when people come to you, this may be the case, that they already know what they have and they just want you to affirm that they have the thing that they know they have and give them the medicine that they already researched that they want and please and thank you and that's all. Does that happen a lot or am I the only person sort of like that does that? Self-diagnosis? Oh yeah, like self The, the WebMD approach to self-awareness. Well, because I feel like Dr. Google. a lot of doctors yeah. have this issue, but I wonder how you handle that specifically because I'm one of the annoying people that does that. No, no I think everybody <laughs> does that. So just to validate, I think it's with the availability of the internet and information, it's perfectly normal. Um, and I do that myself too. And I think it's funny, I'm on all these like doctor groups and they have like things like mugs that say, you know, really mean things like go back and talk to Dr. Google again, right? Yeah, and yeah, people yeah. get angry because patients do come into that. Well, it must in. be annoying, especially because people are fallible and wrong and not, I'm not a doctor. There's no way, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you would be the one that would know. I'm just, well, I think that, I think the idea of getting angry at a patient, though, for self-diagnosing misses the mark insofar as, like, you're suffering, you want some answers and information. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, we all Google and try to come up with what is. So as a, a physician myself, I don't find that annoying in patients. I think they're trying to provide a solution and get information while they're mm -hmm. waiting for their doctor's appointment. Yeah. And it feels, right, the nature of anxiety is you have worry and you have no problem solving or you have no capability to do anything about it. So on mm -hmm. some level, doing research Research when you're suffering makes sense because you're actually solving a problem as opposed to just worrying. But I think the, the only trouble I have is, you know, and I don't actually encounter this a lot, but if someone feels so certain with the medication that they know is going to be right for them, for example. For, for example, one time I had a patient who probably had seen, I don't know, 20 psychiatrists before me and sent like a four-page list of medications that they had been on in the past, which is actually, you know, great. And I have a lot of patients who have seen many, many psychiatrists and been on tons of medications. And I actually kind of enjoy the complexity and having hope and trying to figure out a solution for them. But this one patient who I saw once was very certain that they should start a medication at a very, very high dose, which to me was just not safe. And there's sort of an idea of what is right for your body, but there's also the idea of, you know, when you go to medical school and you learn the side effects and that this may not be good for your heart, even though yeah, it may yeah. help your brain, we don't want to start you at a really high dose. So I, I don't do anything that I don't feel comfortable with. That's not in the best interest of the patient. And that's when patients kind of get angry. And I think that's when there's a sort of mismatch and fit mm -hmm. or, you know, in that case, I think the patient... I think the patient had a lot of other issues that were kind of going on on a relational level that was kind of coming into play. A sense of control, you know, and, and sort of going to a doctor but feeling like you have the answer already. Yeah. 
But that doesn't happen so, so often. I bet there's a sense also. I mean, when I do it, I'm really cool about it. And I'm like, but whatever you think, (laughs) just to put that out there. But I bet even when somebody comes in like that and they're like super prepared and they're really forceful, you're like, okay, that in and of itself is a lot of information to me about what maybe would be. Because we all want safety and control, you know, and having (laughs) access to information and being able to control that. There's a comfort that comes along with it. I mean, I... Even if you're like dilettantishly miss self-diagnosing, it's like still you're like you're trying to create control in the chaos. Yeah, I mean, there's extreme versions of it, obviously, of people taking it to a degree that is scary. Yeah. But I think that it makes a lot of sense to be like, hmm, I wonder what's wrong with me. And who should I be talking now, to about it? Have, you, know? you, have yeah. you guys, in a non-professional way, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, where you take one of those, like, like whether it's BuzzFeed or whatever, or like Psychology <laughs> Today, it's like, are you? A psychopath? Are you? Do you have Aspergers? Do you, do you ever take <laughs> take those tests? And maybe like like for example, I took an Aspergers test. Like I'm definitely a little like I'm wiggly on the spectrum, <laughs> but I'm spectrum adjacent. But I was actually a, a little disappointed that I was that it didn't like confirm my pathology for me. Has that ever happened to you, where you take a test and you're a little disappointed that you're not pathological? I see what you're saying, but there's complexity to it, which brings brings me to my next question, which there's a lot of people that are very pro DSM and there's a lot of people that are very anti DSM mm-hmm. because they so that's say, the DSM is just just for anyone listening. That's the diagnostic statistics. What is it? Yeah, something, something, something diagnostic yeah. statistics. And we're up there like DSM five now, yeah. seven, we're seven. At yeah. five. I well think. done. OK. Um, there's people that think that human the human experience is far more complex mm. than can be boiled down into the DSM. But then there are people that say it's necessary to have these kind of general ideas so that we know where do you fall on that line. It's interesting because I just was like skimming a study on the DSM and how there is just so much repetition of symptoms amongst mm-hmm. multiple different diagnoses, mm-hmm. which I think we all know. And it's sort of like diagnoses in general are kind of like this Venn diagram of over- overlapping circles to begin with. I do think some level of organization is necessary Mm -hmm. as far as figuring out what someone is dealing with. And we have to somehow honor it by giving it a name or giving it a number or something. And so in a very simplistic way, like an organization to the idea of our mental health, I think is helpful. I'll also say diagnoses are very Mm person-specific. So some people come in, I've sort of seen it go both ways. So some people, you know, they've been suffering their whole life from a set of symptoms and people have, you know, sort of said like, oh, it's very normal to be feel depressed and just hate your life or, you know, it's because your job is this or whatever the case may be, they've sort of been told it's normal and they should just kind of suck it up. And so to have a doctor or therapist, psychologist, whomever, kind of see them, really see them and say, no, your suffering is an illness yeah. and it's called major depression. Mm-hmm. You know, to some people, being identified as having an illness is actually really healing. And that's kind of bears yeah. true in certain types of therapy as well, where you sort of apply that diagnosis and it can be incredibly healing to have a name for something. On the other hand, having a diagnosis can actually be really negative. So I had a patient once that was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder mm-hmm. at some point during his 20s. 20s. And he came in sort of wearing it as though he had been marked for mm-hmm. life with this terrible diagnosis that someone along the lines had given him. And so part of our work together in, in doing medication, but a little bit of therapy was sort of realizing that to him, this diagnosis was a really negative thing, but it was just the word that was negative. And he was very aware of sort of his coping skills. And we talked to him about why that happened. And one of my mentors once said something that I love, which is that, all the things we become in childhood allow us to survive to become an adult. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we acquire these skills in childhood that really allow us to survive bad parenting, for example. And so with borderline personality disorder, I like to give the example that, you know, if your parent is neglectful and abusive, when they are sort of smiling, you kind of run to them. And it's a day where it's like, oh, mom is feeling good today. I'm going to get a hug. I'm going to get cereal. And then, you know, you know, okay, I'm connected. She's happy. Okay, I'm happy. The next day, you know, you see mom kind of slam the door when she comes home. And children immediately pick up on that energy, right? Mm-hmm. And they realize, oh, mom's really bad. I might get hit. She's going to ignore me. Today's a bad day. I need to go take care of myself in my bedroom. So the world becomes very black or white. Thank you for just describing my child. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> um, yeah, so I think it allows those kids to survive, right? Because if you didn't, you might stay in the room and get hit right? Or, or worse, get killed, right? So if you just lived in the gray, it wouldn't be good. It allows people to, to live and get through their childhood. So we talked about this with this patient. And I said, all those skills, we'll call them skills, or just the way you adapted, the way your brain and your behaviors formed, allowed you to survive this childhood. And that is actually truly amazing. The problem is that now when you're an adult, those ways of adapting are now maladaptive mm-hmm. or bad. Mm-hmm. And so now when you, you know, when your friend forgets to text you back and you end the relationship, relationship in a very black or white way. You know, they treated me wrong. I'm done with that person. It's maladaptive and you're losing relationships and you don't want that. Your goal is to have relationships. So yes, those symptoms might have been borderline personality disorder as a kid and now they're hurting you and now we need to kind of work in therapy to change those coping skills. It always reminds me of the Japanese soldier in the Philippines. Do you know this story? I don't know if I do. So the war had ended. World War II ended And there was one Japanese soldier in the Philippines, and no one told him the war had ended. And I think in the mid-50s, they finally brought him back to Japan, and and, and he sat down with the emperor, and the emperor was like, the war's over, because no one told him. So from 1945, whenever the war ended, until 19-whenever, he was still fighting the war. You know, in his in the jungle in the uh-huh. Philippines, this one man army, because oh. no one had told him the war had ended. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of like this patient, Completely. like like yes. the war is over. Yes. You can let go of the armor. You can let, yes. but it's so hard when, like, it's all you've ever known. Right. I do wonder, and I don't want to in any way malign or dismiss DSM diagnoses, but it does seem sometimes like some diagnoses become real trendy for a minute. Mm. Like mm. borderline personality disorder, it seemed like it had its moment where it was like the Dalmatians of diagnoses, where suddenly everyone was like, I'm BPD. And I was like, oh, it's like the same people who go out and buy Labradoodles. <laughs> like, again, I've I know people who have very serious borderline personality mm. disorder, mm. but it does seem like some some people were like, well, I don't know what's wrong with me. I bet you I have, I have BPD. Mm-hmm. Do you ever see that where people come in and they've read an article in Red Book or whatever? Or Red Ellen? Book. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Is Red parade? Book still around? I don't know. <laughs> Woman's but, Day. <laughs> yeah, but they, they've read an article in Parade Magazine yeah. um, about, okay, I'm going to throw myself under the bus. I do this. Like, I'll read about some type of diagnosis, and I'll be like, oh, I bet you I have that. Like, do you remember the good old days of riding the subway in New York, and you'd see, like, an ad in the subway, like, are you tired? Yes. Are you irritable? Oh, all the time. Are you prone to depression? (laughs) Yes. Do you have lupus? I guess I have lupus. <laughs> yeah. Like you'd read these general symptoms. You'd be like, well, clearly now I have lupus. And mm-hmm. you're like, no, you don't have lupus. But the same thing with like borderline personality disorder. I know people who had self-diagnosed after reading their article in Parade or Red Book <laughs> or Highlights magazine. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think that's happened very much so in the last three years with the during the pandemic mm-hmm. with ADHD specifically. Hey, don't um, you think you have that? Yes, I think I have that. You don't. <laughs> I did a okay. test for it last week. We don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think as your clinician, you don't have ADHD. <laughs> well, maybe, yeah, maybe you do. Maybe you don't. I, I'm not sure, but I, I think the way information is disseminated has a lot of impact on how people relate to it. So during the pandemic, you know, this was sort of put out in the Wall Street Journal in a series of articles. So I, I'm just sort of quoting the Wall Street Journal, but the, there was a big startup called Cerebral that was doing tons and tons of business, and at one point there was a report that someone on their sort of executive team said, get everyone on stimulants because then they'll be sort of patients for life. And so what happened purportedly by the the Wall Street Journal is that they sort of started doing tons of ADHD diagnoses and prescribing medications um, from a top-down approach and doing a lot of kind of what I would call false advertising, which was later called out and then had to be removed. For example, there was a big TikTok push and a lot of the articles had one symptom, or sorry, not articles, TikTok videos had a, like, are you a binge eater? If so, you probably have ADHD, which is, first of all, not even a symptom of ADHD. Whoa. You know, maybe some people with ADHD have binge eating and then some ADHD medications I think, I think binge be eating is generally a symptom of binge eating. <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So what that did, though, it was, it was false information. Um, and there was a study that also showed with regard to mental health that TikTok, about 50% of the information is actually false 
false on TikTok. So it's really important to know Wait, kind of the source of information. Hold on just a second. Back up. You're saying social media isn't 100% true? I know. It's crazy. It's crazy. You rocked me to the foundations well, of my... Yeah. Can I just say often when I'm like, I read an article that said... It was a TikTok. Yeah. yeah. Which, is actually, which is actually fine, right? If you're getting it from like from like physicians, right? But I think that 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 sort of statistic is because a lot of people suffering or, you know, who just kind of know something about something are kind of putting out information that may not be accurate. But that ended up starting in this cascade of people getting diagnosed with ADHD that, you know, now there's this nationwide stimulant shortage yeah. and maybe in part because of that. And yeah. it can be dangerous. A, a good friend of ours has a ADHD and he's having a very hard time getting Adderall and he needs it. I mean, one thing I would just want to say is we're having a lovely time and we're laughing and it might sound like I or any of us are making light of some of these diagnoses. To be clear, I'm not. I'm not making light of lupus. I'm not making light of ADHD. I'm not making light of borderline personality disorder. I think that these things are incredibly serious and if someone's suffering through them, I'm not, not making light of them. I'm just trying to make light of people like me who miss self-diagnose sometimes because they're bored. <laughs> well, I mean, that's like another tangent we could go on. But, you know, I'm, I'm also not saying I, these disorders are very debilitating. And that's for most patients that I see, it's really life impairing. And that's yeah. when you want to consider potentially treatment and or medication. Um, and and, and many, I was just feeling preemptively guilting about like someone listening and feeling like we are making fun of their diagnosis. And I just want to be super clear, like, absolutely not. If someone's suffering, mm -hmm. by all means, I hope they get the care that they need and we're not making light of their suffering. Yeah, no, if anything, my message sort of to everyone is if if someone is suffering, they should seek help. Yeah. And it, regardless of whether it has a label or not or is ADHD or it's not. And that's what I don't blame any of these patients that were diagnosed, you know, potentially inappropriately or on medication because they needed something and they were seeking help. It's the medical system, mm -hmm. in my opinion, and the prescribers and, you know, the doctors that sort of failed the patients. So mm -hmm. I don't think any patient is at fault. If someone needs help and they're getting help. That's the hardest step. Can I can I tell one? pharmacological story. So I went to a psychiatrist to potentially get prescribed. And at the end of our session, he was like, so what do you want? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, Dude, what, just name something. What do you want? I was like, wow. I was like, shouldn't you prescribe me? He's like, and he said verbatim, he's like, they're all kind of the same. Well, I think there's <laughs> there's some truth to that. Yeah. Like, you know, some we have classes of medications like the SSRIs that we use mm -hmm. for anxiety and depression, and they are very similar with subtle differences. So, similar to you were mentioning clonopin or Xanax, yeah. and those are the benzodiazepines. So, you know, as a group or a class, they're very comparable with sort of subtle variations in in each. So it's an interesting approach. I remember being very excited with myself when I finally learned what the SSRI acronym stood for. Because it's the weird, you know, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Oh, I yes. thought it was like so sad, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just love that idea of like selectively inhibits reuptake. Like this seems the most complicated way of saying, oh, it keeps the serotonin in your synapses. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, it selectively inhibits the reuptake. There's a lot of like poor nomenclature going on in but what psychiatry. A cool acronym. But yeah, I, I don't have much experience with the actual drug. I hope it helps people, but it's I'm a, I just get real pleased with myself when I figure out an acronym. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have a lot going on, so if like I can figure out acronyms, <laughs> you got it. You got it right. If I can win at click word, like. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a whole list of like very general questions. Mm. One is, do you have who are your psychiatric or psychological or even just philosophical heroes. Well, you mentioned Victor Krankel um, and Search for Meeting. That's a book I read probably 20 years ago. But really Funny, we actually talked to a friend of ours who is a therapist the other day, and Victor Frankel was her hero as well. Yeah, so I think that book in general, not specifically for medicine, but just for life, is really meaningful to me. Can I just contextualize him for people oh, yes, who might not be please. familiar? So Victor Frankel invented this type of therapy called logotherapy, and he developed his philosophy, his psychology, in Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. He was an Auschwitz survivor. For me, the most remarkable, memorable quote of his, between stimulus and response, Response is a space, and within that space resides all of our freedom. 
Wow. That's more detail than I remember. So no. thank you. But yes. <laughs> that's my favorite Agreed. Victor Frankl quote. And the fact that he went through Auschwitz. Yes. And he lost his entire family, I believe. And he still believed that we could choose our responses. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to identify as victims. Like mm -hmm. we had the ability to transcend adversity. And when you've gone through Auschwitz and lost your family, clearly he knew of what he spoke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that sort of speaks to the depth of loss that a person can experience and and still come out sort of surviving or even mm -hmm. thriving in some cases. So as far as other sources of mentorship meaning, um, in general, I, I like sort of consuming the research as it comes out and learning about new sort of treatment modalities um, and ways to kind of help people, including different types of therapy, you know, or medications right now. You know, psychedelics and ketamine are sort of the newest mm -hmm. um, form of treatment that we're kind of exploring on more of a hopefully prescribing, controlled, mm -hmm. uh, approved way in the coming years. And I have a really great community within UCLA where I still kind of learn aggressively by working with an old mentor and kind of paying for supervision so that we can discuss the latest research and that sort of thing. And I think as far as I was trained in a bunch of different types of therapy as well, so cognitive behavioral therapy that you mentioned, another type of therapy is called IPT or interpersonal therapy, which is a very sort of focused 16 to 20 week sessions um, or weeks hmm. um, where you kind of start and end um, with a very kind of formulaic path to uh, treating things like grief or depression. So I really sort of like using those and kind of pull from those when working with patients. And as far as other, I sort of like to, you know, kind of consume pop culture books on, you know, I'm starting one called Mother Hunger right now, which is the relationship between daughters and mothers and, you know, what's at loss there. Lindsay, right? that down. <laughs> Uh, I already have it. <laughs> 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 okay, yeah. So I think there's a lot to, I, you know, I like sort of enjoy reading a lot of nonfiction in my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. I know that modalities are always evolving and there's always new, like, I know um, psilocybin is kind of making its way up through and there's always this evolution happening. But I wonder if anyone comes in and you're just like, man, I wish I could lobotomize this guy. <laughs> no, I've actually never, never really had that thought before. You don't um, keep a little no. ice pick in your yeah. drawer. It's like, no. you know, what? I've got the answer to yeah. all your problems. Totally. I just go in through your nose, take your prefrontal cortex. Everything's going to be fine. Totally. I think that's the only treatment we've decided, like, there really is no utility in a lobotomy anymore. I mean, it, you know, things like ECT, actually, electroconvulsive therapy, which is an induced seizure, right? The Sylvia Plath approach. Yeah. yeah. And it's actually actually one of the most effective means of treating severe depression and a couple of other things. So it's still very much used, very much effective. But some people sometimes when I suggest kind of that as one of many options for treatment and just sort of laying the groundwork, you have a lot of options, you know, look at me like I've suggested a, a lobotomy, but it's, it's, it's kind of like saying different. like, have you considered leeches? Yeah yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So and some people are sort of horrified at the suggestion, but I think that's mostly because of how ECT has been described in movies. Yeah, I mean, Sylvia Plath would definitely not be the ideal poster child for electroconvulsive yes. therapy. Yes. How does that, why does that work so well for depression? So, and I don't practice ECT, so I'm, you know, as far as the details, you know, I'm not an expert in that. But essentially the, what an induced seizure does is it sort of floods the brain with the sort of the neurochemicals, um, the, all, which include all the feel-good ones um, like dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin. And so it it sort of just changes the brain's chemistry through mm -hmm. the treatment itself. And I've seen, when I was training, I, I I literally saw a man who was so depressed he could not speak and mm -hmm. spoken in weeks. And he also could not walk anymore. The depression oh. was so severe, which some people don't understand that either, that depression can just rob you of absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. And after one treatment, he was speaking and talking again. It was truly, Whoa. truly amazing. And so there is a role for it. But I also understand why many people are fearful given how it's been sort of depicted in the media, which I think is kind of true for a lot of aspects of mental health as well. It's gotten some bad press. Yeah. Also, there's the, there's over time, things become fine-tuned. You know, I imagine like electroconvulsive therapy in the 40s and 50s was a blunt object. Right. You know, <laughs> and now they kind of understand it better. So, you know, they're not hitting someone on the head with a hammer. Mm -hmm. It's like giving gentle little electrical love taps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Minimum effective dose. Yes. 
So, Linz, I have a bunch of questions, but do you have... I also feel like, generally speaking, I monopolize things, what with the patriarchy and whatnot. So, <laughs> well, Speaking of the patriarchy, I do have a, a question. So my question, it's not necessarily a patriarchal question. It's more <laughs> of like a capitalism issue, which is a part of patriarchy, in my opinion. Who invited the hippie? <laughs> um, so but I think people sometimes view what you and people in your field do as not always the most accessible thing to people of a certain income bracket. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that your services are more uh, accessible? Is there a way to get them? Like, are there services or how does that work from an accessibility standpoint? Yeah, it's a great question because it's about less than 50% of our country has a psychiatrist in every county, which Mm -hmm. is crazy. That's just a psychiatrist. So not even, we're not even talking about children, which the problem is far worse. Mm -hmm. So mental health care in general is is minimal compared to the number of people who meet, need help in our mm-hmm. in our country and it's a, it got worse essentially during the pandemic when many people got depressed so luckily you know hopefully our things are changing so that's you know that's a big purpose in my life is to increase access to care. So I I started out after training and and still do see patients myself in a private practice, sort of one-on-one. But, you know, as an individual, I can only see one person at a time. So in 2020, I created a company called Remedy Psychiatry with the premise that everyone really deserves to have a mental health care provider who knows their name and knows who they are and can be more affordable and accessible. And so the goal was to have it over telehealth to sort of pass on, and this was pre-pandemic, um, but to pass on the cost savings of offices to the patient so it could be more affordable to patients. And so we could also reach people in geographic areas who have no access to care. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's been great since we've seen thousands of patients and we see kids, and it's been really, really amazing to see kind of what can happen. So yeah, one of my goals is to kind of increase access to care. Um, and I think it's access on multiple levels. So it is really hard even, you know, here in Los Angeles, a big city to find a psychiatrist, even one that takes cash and is wildly expensive, $600 to $1,000 an hour, it can be still weeks to months to get an appointment. And most people don't have that. So yeah. having broader access where people can use their insurance or at Remedy, we have sort of a cash budget friendly monthly option. So mm-hmm. people don't have to drop $300 for an appointment. It's very low fixed rate per month mm-hmm. has been really helpful and kind of transformative. And now we've seen kids in the middle of California who had no access to care, including within their county system, yeah. where there's just literally nobody to treat them. And it's it's really horrible. I just last week was in the Mammoth area and I met with the hospital there and they don't have a psychiatrist in all of Mammoth. They have somebody oh. comes two days a month. And this is Mammoth, which is like a fairly affluent, you know, people bring a lot of money in there, but they don't have any psychiatrist in the entire town. So we talked, I talked about bringing kind of remedy and telehealth because the, the hospital and some of the the therapists said, well, people don't always have cars and they don't have Wi-Fi even. So is telehealth even accessible? No, it's actually not. Yeah. So we talked about having them bring sort of like a van or office with Remedy where our team could see people who don't have cars or don't have Wi-Fi and kind of come in, which is really exciting to be reaching those people. Um, so the, the problem is just multifaceted. It's, it's about finances. It's about geography. Mm-hmm. It's about lack of providers and just you know, even having enough people in the workforce. Not to mention the ongoing stigma around mental health. Yes. You know, especially in certain communities, it's like you're not allowed. Like you were talking about growing up where like in your family, it just wasn't addressed. In my family, it certainly was not addressed. And even and, mine wasn't. and yeah. wasn't. But also geographically, culturally, culturally. there's just so yeah. much people are afraid of it. But I wish looking back... And, you know, I had the internet, but I was even afraid to look it up. And there was nothing in my school that told me where to get it. And I just, I think people just don't know what to do when they're suffering for the most part. Yeah, we don't know what we don't know. So if we don't know we're suffering from depression or anxiety, I was actually just talking about this with the patient today, which is, you know, if you're having your first episode of depression, for example, you may not know that it's depression. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to someone and saying like, oh, I feel sad today. And they say like, oh, you know, didn't your boyfriend break up with you? That's why you're sad. It's normal. And then you're going to someone else and saying like, I don't have any appetite. And that person's like, well, you know, that's kind of normal. You just, you're, you're getting sort of 
piecemeal misinformation versus sort of going to a professional. And this is why I would mm-hmm. say that anyone who's suffering should go to a professional. Because once you combine all those details, someone may say to you, you're suffering and this is called depression. Yeah. It's not just normal. It's a very different response. But a lot of people don't have access or they grew up in a family where it's, or a culture or a location where it's, yeah, it's it's looked down upon even to even speak about mental health care, let alone get treatment, therapy, yeah. or medication. Or to and, acknowledge to yourself that you're even suffering. Yeah. I think back to myself and also everyone that I knew. I think a lot of people were having a really hard time and afraid to even admit to themselves what they were experiencing was suffering. Yeah, yeah. I think there's reticence to, yeah, to also be ill. So I Mm -hmm. think, or have a diagnosis or, or yes, be suffering. And so avoiding that, you know, can often make us feel as though it's not happening. It's a little Mm -hmm. bit, you know, fantastical as far Mm -hmm. as thinking, but Yeah, a lot of people don't want to name it. Because the people who are listening, and hi to everyone who's listening, I want to be, to try and be of service to them Mm -hmm. insofar as we can. So like, granted, everybody listening is a different individual. Mm -hmm. And I assume everyone's listening on their own, like at home, in traffic, commuting. Mm -hmm. Is it feasible to offer advice to people based on your experience professionally, personally, with research, as a doctor, as a clinician? I mean, maybe that's the most ridiculous question I can think of because everybody's so different and everyone's dealing with different things. But generally speaking, are there suggestions you might have to someone who's struggling or any advice you might be able to give to people? Absolutely. I would say that to to anyone, so anyone listening, that what you are feeling or thinking has been felt or thought before. So no one is alone. And that's the sort of beauty of being human is that even though we're all very different, every thought and feeling has been experienced before. Even if someone is a solipsist. (laughs) Yes, yes, exactly. (laughs) And that includes things like feeling hopeless or suicidal. So a lot of times people feel shameful that they shouldn't want to die or they shouldn't feel like ending their lives. And I, I just want people to know that that is a very felt experience for many, many people. And so I think the first thing I would recommend for anyone is to seek help from a medical professional and to be valuing themselves enough to know that it's worth it and that they can Mm -hmm. feel better and that their suffering is likely only temporary, but they just need to go to find a professional. And if they have, you know, some, that being said, sometimes people have a bad experience and sort of see a psychiatrist that wasn't, you know, very warm or a therapist that wasn't a good fit. And it's very much like dating. So I tell Mm -hmm. my patients like, you know, Therapy is like dating. You need to find a good fit. And sometimes it takes a few people, but you're worth it. Mm-hmm. Right. So everyone who is feeling something negative, whether it's anxiety or depression or I'm so alone or I'm ashamed and I don't want to see help, it's all been felt before and it's okay. And they deserve to get help from a medical professional and maybe another if the first one isn't a good fit. Great. So many people are struggling. I was going to say everyone's struggling, but not everyone's struggling. The majority of people are struggling. You know, mm-hmm. In one way or another. We're yeah. all struggling. Yeah, you know, Everything is exacerbated, is whether it's traffic, the pandemic, the way people eat, social media, mm-hmm. looking at bright lights before you go to bed, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everything is exacerbating already fragile psyches. Mm -hmm. And so to just sort of reiterate what you're saying, like if you're struggling, you're not alone. If you're dealing with addiction, there are a lot of people out there who are in the exact same place and a lot of people who've gotten better. And one thing that I find incredibly encouraging, and I'm going to make a yoga analogy. When I first started, do do you ever, do you do yoga? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm not a religious yogi, but definitely done it So when all of us, when we started doing yoga, I assume... We were bad at it. Same way, unless like, you come into it as a dancer or or some or yeah, something like that. Same thing missed. with guitar. First time I tried playing guitar, I was terrible at it. But I remember with yoga, like all of a sudden, like after a month or so, I was like, oh, I can touch my toes now. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm learning that. Like I like I figured it out. And the thing, and this is so self evident, but I don't think we really acknowledge the power of this. Is if you consistently apply yourself to something, mm-hmm. it'll get better. Yeah. You know, like if you mm-hmm. if you if you pick up a guitar every day, within six months you'll be a good guitar player. And so mm-hmm. with self care, it's the same thing. Like reaching out to therapists, talking about it with healthcare professionals, like by just by doing this, by going to therapy, it will get better. Cause I think a lot of people are hopeless, you know, mm-hmm. and feel like, oh, I don't know what to do. And even if I did, it's not gonna get better. 
but concerted effort makes things get better. Yeah. You know? I like to normalize this as well. You know, and we all need help. So we can't do it from within. So we, you know, we use teachers and we go to school to learn academics. We get coaches and personal trainers to, you know, improve our body. We get nutritionists when we need to change our diet. We go to spiritual things to sort of grow our spiritual side, but we don't do a lot consciously in our culture to improve our emotional health or our behavioral health. And that's what is getting help, you know, from a therapist or a medical professional in the mental health field is sort of just giving attention to your emotions and your mind and your behavior, which would be wonderful if we all had access mm -hmm. to do that. And if we looked at it like getting a personal trainer almost as something mm -hmm. that's, you know, fancy and wonderful, and if everyone could do it, we would, as opposed to how we kind of view mental health as though there's something wrong. I think a lot of it has to do with, and this is something I've seen and experienced, is that notion of believing that you have value and that you are worth putting in the time and effort. Mm. I think one of the saddest things is that people just don't think that self-care is is worth it because they don't see their worth. They don't mm. think that they're a person of value in the world. And they think all they have to do is get through the days, support the people immediately around them, be able to pay the rent. And that's it. They don't see their value. And I, you mentioned that. And I was like, that is the biggest part of it. Mm -hmm. That's part of the struggle that I think people don't consider is just that feeling of I deserve to it, be free and live a life mm -hmm. that is full. And, and also exacerbated by compare and despair, mm -hmm. you know, because you look at social media and everybody's dancing better and getting and everybody's more, giving better misinformation and getting, on and mental getting health more, care and getting filter more, yeah. and getting more <laughs> likes and looking younger and going to more exotic places it's like comparing and despairing just sort of like takes that low self-esteem that lack of self-worth and just keeps spiraling it down yeah it's something that's been there that's always been there and it's not getting any better and that was i think what in my personal journey what changed my experience was having that first sense of, oh, my actions matter. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I am a person that matters and I should probably put some effort into being better at being a person since I do actually matter. And figuring mm -hmm. that out changed my entire life. But I don't think I would have figured it out if I hadn't been in New York and L.A. and been around people who mm -hmm. had had yeah. access to mental health care before and could be like, hey, <laughs> yeah, think about this in a different way if you might. Yeah. So that I think is a huge part of it. Yeah. And I, I would just say, yeah, every I think every single person on, on Earth is of value just for the being themselves. And mm -hmm. I, I would also add to that by saying I have never met someone who's been affected by another person's suicide who felt like it was a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I say that because sometimes people feel so bad in the depths of the depression that the pain is horrible and they feel like they're no use to anyone. And there's a common thought of the, the world would be better off without me or my friends and family would be better off without me. And I would just say I've never heard another human say that to be true. So, you know, suicide and loss of life leads to sort of devastation and it's just a distortion. So, for the longest time when I was growing up, I, even when I started going to therapy, you know, I did dynamic psychoanalysis, did CBT, did psychodrama, did, you know, somatic therapy. The focus was always on the individual. You know, the focus was on my experience, my childhood, my trauma, my coping skills. My, it was very individualistic, so much so that it almost seems self-evident to say that. But a few years ago, well, okay, not a few years ago. I'm old, so everything seems a few years ago. Like maybe 12 <laughs> years ago, I was doing a type of therapy that had an, what I think of as an existential component mm. where it, of course, looked at the individual's experience, but it also looked at who we were as a species. It looked at the hereditary aspects of it, um, not just as an individual, but collectively, like who we are as humans. And I found that to be so interesting, very helpful as well, sort of like, realizing like because we keep coming back to this saying like everybody's struggling mm -hmm. and like oh maybe this is just a part of our mm -hmm. species this yeah. is a part of like and Lindsay, i don't know if i've told this story before but i was watching a nature documentary a few years ago 
And in the nature documentary, they there was a watering hole somewhere in Africa, and it was the middle of the summer, and it was a drought, and so every creature for like twenty miles around had mm-hmm. gone to this watering hole. So it was the the lions and the leopards and the hippos and the crocodiles and like the vicious, all these vicious creatures. And there in the middle of it were a few monkeys, these tiny little bitty monkeys hiding behind a bush, occasionally working up the courage to run to the watering hole, scoop up some water. And imagine what the water is like after hippos and everybody else (laughs) has been in it. They scoop up a handful of water and run back to the bush and hope they don't get eaten. And I was watching this documentary and I was like, oh, those are our ancestors. Also, that's what I would have (laughs) done. Yeah. But like they're... These terrified monkeys, we, we're descended from vicious, terrified monkeys. Mm-hmm. It helped me personally when I expanded my awareness and realized, like, yes, I have my issues. I have my experience, my childhood trauma. But there's also on a very broad, almost Jungian level, the idea of, like, human inherited predispositions towards mm-hmm. anxiety, towards depression, mm-hmm. Like the old expression that we're sort of like, we are Velcro for negative emotions Mm -hmm. and Teflon for positive emotions. And I was just wondering if either of you have any thoughts about the looking at human emotions, looking at our experiences less as individuals and more as who we are as these descendants of terrified monkeys. I agree completely with the idea that we're sort of more conditioned to we're we're it's more reinforcing to have negative thoughts about survival. So yeah, this idea of if I don't get water, I'll die. So therefore, I need to have water with me all the time, right? That's a, a variation of what we might now deem to be anxiety because we have water everywhere. But that allowed our generations before us to sort of survive with water and food and that sort of thing. So. Yeah, I think that that sort of speaks to the genetic component of, you know, all mental health issues, which is very strong for for many uh, mental health disorders. And you can kind of see it, too, in families. And I think that can be helpful for people to kind of realize, like, oh, now I see my mom is really, really anxious. And this wasn't something that even in some cases happened to me or that I did wrong. But this is just my genetic lineage as a human being. And, uh, yeah, I think it, on some level it can be kind of adaptive if people are and helpful, if people worry and then they find a solution, but it's the sort of obsessional worries that kind of lead to suffering where we don't have a solution. Yeah, I mean, I think that our anxiety saved us for such a long time. And now we have all of this technology and our lives are kind of, for the most part, we have access to things that will help us be okay. (laughs) But our brains still haven't quite caught up to that. It, that what you're saying is so fascinating. Like imagine 200 years ago going to someone like who's hungry and filthy with their teeth rotting out of their head somewhere in northern Europe and saying to them, okay, imagine a world where within your house you have perfectly clean water coming out of multiple outlets. You have access to more calories than any human could ever imagine. You are safe from, for the most part, you're safe from everything. You have this thing called dentistry, which keeps your teeth from rotting out of your head. And you have diagnostics that enable you to understand your human health down to a cellular level. Oh, and by the way, you have this little box that you carry with you that enables you to communicate with everyone you care about and have access to every piece of information ever recorded. That person would be like, I'd be the happiest person in the world. Lo and behold, we're probably just as anxious and depressed, if not more so than they were then. It is fascinating. Like, we fixed everything. Well, for the most part, there are still many, many people oh, who do not I, yes, have I, access to these things. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to be glib and say, like, yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to, it's such a thing of privilege that so we fixed everything. But for a lot, okay, what I will say is for quite a lot of people on the planet, their material circumstances are a lot better now than they were 200 years ago. Um, And I'm not in any way making (laughs) light of people suffering or where they exist on the socioeconomic scale. But for a lot of people, the problem now is they have access to too many calories. They have access Mm -hmm. to too much stimulation. It's uh, it really is fascinating. There's something. So what it says about our species that when 
when people are given tons of calories and clean water, their response is to watch Fox News and storm the Capitol on January 6th, like to be outraged at something. And it is just this fascinating aspect, I think, of the human condition where like no matter how perfect or wonderful our circumstances, we're still going to find ways to be angry and anxious. Well, I think we always, we're still, and I, we've said this before, but in many ways we are still a, a caveman in a cave and a bear could come in at any moment and we're st- always mm-hmm. trying to identify what is the bear. Yeah. yeah. And what, what? And also I would say one of the, so I agree with you, Moby, all those things that we have now were things we were fighting for, for survival. But one of the things we have less of now, which is one of the most protective factors for mental health is a sense of community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. that is a huge co- sort of factor in correlation with depression. Um, and even, you know, postpartum depression, for example, not having a support network and community really is a risk factor for, for postpartum depression. Yeah, so, you're absolutely right. We don't, even though we have social media, that's not a replacement for like the village. And I think that's mm-hmm. a lot of people are suffering kind of alone. Mm-hmm. And that was probably a huge protective factor thousands of years ago, people yes. living together in a community. And yeah, and the have. stress reduction. I sometimes think about this like, what, well, because I've never lived in a community really. You know, I've always lived, I lived in a house with a person when I was growing up. And then I moved to an apartment with a person. And then for, since then, I've always lived by myself. Mm. But that idea of community suddenly it takes the stress out of child rearing. Mm. Mm-hmm. It takes the stress out of relationships. It takes the stress out of almost everything because everything is sort of outsourced. Mm-hmm. You know, you imagine a community with like kids running around with a bunch of other kids. And so you're not looking after your child. You're sort of looking after the group of children. And you're absolutely right. Like it is that almost reductive occult razor of why are we struggling? Mm. It's like, well, all of our ancestors for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years thrived in community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it om- I, I was talking about this with some friends a long time ago about how it's so much easier to understand with penguins. You take a penguin and put it in a box in New York City and give it a lot of empty calories, but no real access to other penguins. And it's pretty easy to understand. It's going to be a very unhappy penguin. <laughs> now do the same with a human being. And we're like, oh, but they should thrive. Yeah, and they have their own apartment. They're lucky. Like, but without yeah, the penguins. They're wealthy. The, yeah, like the penguin is yeah. depressed without other penguins. Humans are depressed without actual vital community. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah, and with this sort of this idea that social media is a – as a replacement for that, I think is what's really kind of hurting younger generations as far as feeling even less connected, even yeah. though they may be connected through social media or texting or phones and that sort of thing. So I have two sort of wrapping up type questions. Go with it. Um, one of mine is, again, going back to the people who are listening, something to, to try and be of service to them is what – Insofar as you can generalize, what impediments do you find? Are there are, are there sort of generalized recurring impediments that you find with your clients? Like impediments as far in, in their functioning in their own life? Is that what you mean? Or and, impediments and even, or even to in, in, I mean, because we discussed one is the unwillingness to reach out to people. Mm. Um, the unwillingness to value yourself. Mm. But are there more specific ones... Uh, Like, for example, when I first started therapy, one of my impediments was catastrophizing Mm. and, and like, almost the seduction of, like, the negativity. When I'd go to therapy, I'd be like, oh, I've got to think of all the trauma from my childhood. And it became addictive. Mm. And I realized, I was like, oh, I'm harming. Like, I'm, I'm actually depressing myself, dredging stuff up just to impress my therapist. Mm. And I'm just wondering if, if there are any impediments like that that you've encountered with clients. Yeah, so I think it's so catastrophizing is a is a cognitive error, like a brain error when we sort of assess some data and we think of the catastrophic outcome. And that's a really common experience for people with anxiety. So it's not just, okay, I'm going to get on the freeway or the expressway. It's, oh my God, I'm going to die if I get on there. And so that one of the tenets of cognitive behavioral therapy is not to just stay with what you think or feel in that moment, but is to sort of think about all the data out there. Like, okay, if you really are going to get in a car, what is the true likelihood of getting in a car accident? And you don't really have to even know, but if you think actually it's probably 1%, that allows you to reframe your own thought Mm -hmm. to be more accurate 
accurate Mm -hmm. and therefore you're less kind of fearful. So I would say that actually that catastrophic thinking is a a really common, common sort of impediment, so to speak, or creator, I would say, of anxiety for a lot of people. I think a lot of people feel just, as I sort of alluded to earlier, very alone in their emotions. So when people feel depressed, they can feel sad or angry or nothing. Sometimes people feel just absolutely nothing. And they feel almost shame about having these negative emotions. And I think that leads to people not getting help. So on some level, one impediment for a lot of people is feeling as though they're the only person and as though their feelings are bad. So just sort of saying, it's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel angry or it's okay to feel nothing. It just might mean that you you need help and that you could feel better. You reminded me of when I first got sober. And Lindsay, I don't know if you've had this experience in your group stuff. But <laughs> in when I first got sober, one of the things that amazed me is I would go to this room full of strangers, some of whom were gangsters, some of whom were politicians, some of whom were rock stars, some like the most diverse group of people. And everyone was sharing about things that I was hiding, their fears, their depression, their anxiety, their shame around certain things. And it was so remarkably liberating Mm -hmm. to what you're saying is to realize like, oh, the things I'm ashamed of, the things I'm hiding are common to almost every person Mm -hmm. on the planet. And it's really, and I hope for the people who are listening, if you haven't had that experience of recognizing that what you're going through is shared with a lot of people, I hope you get to, whether it's in group therapy or a 12-step program or what have you, like recognizing that you're not alone and there's nothing thankfully unique about what we're struggling Mm -hmm. with. Yeah, and I I would go so far as to say, too, once people realize someone else is suffering in the same way, that vulnerability breeds connection and that Absolutely. other people are drawn when when someone shares. So I think even when I was listening to, to your podcast, the first couple of podcasts in the series, just hearing, oh, you're anxious too, because I was driving here feeling <laughs> so anxious myself. Yeah. And it, it just sort of brought the level down. Oh, right. We're all human. We all mm-hmm. get anxious about certain things. So yeah, that lack of aloneness, no matter what you're feeling, is I think really important. Um, because none of it is novel and none of it is even worthy of feeling shame. It's just an emotion or it's a thought. And that's it. So the one last one I have is tangentially related, but sort of not related to anything professional. What non-therapeutic practices do you value and do you recommend for other people? Yeah. So I, I, you know, with all my patients and all the patients my team sees, we really believe in sort of holistic health. And what I would say, and this is supported by all the research, is that it's critically important to eat healthy whole foods. They're 60% less associated with depression than processed foods. Mm. It's really important to get exercise. The research shows it reduces symptoms of anxiety, depression, ADHD, among other things. Sleep is critically important. So reading the book Sleep right now, and everyone should be getting seven to nine hours of sleep per night. Anything less than seven is associated with chronic disease and what? weight gain and is considered chronic sleep deprivation. You're talking in a week? <laughs> so, so, <laughs> yeah, yes, was, if you I don't wish. get it and you take a little nap, does that count towards it? <laughs> Naps are okay. I mean, yeah, so it's it getting the seven to nine hours in 24 hours. Okay, great, great. Um, I Love think that. That's helpful. Like, circadian rhythm is probably best to get most of it yeah. at night. But yeah, <laughs> sleep is like the, num- I, I call it sort of the number one medicine. And there's so many people who don't get good sleep. I'm worried so, about Moby right now. It's not my sleep is not my strong suit. <laughs> yeah, and there's also a lot of people who have undiagnosed sleep apnea, which is not getting oxygen to your brain, which causes a host of other problems and is really undiagnosed. Even kids as young as two can have sleep apnea. So sleep is really important. I believe wholeheartedly anybody who's curious about themselves should do therapy if they mm-hmm. can access it at an affordable rate. So, and if they feel connected to the therapist and though it's productive and helpful. Some people have have reservations and don't want to and don't want to open up a trauma box, for example, but that should all be monitored and mm-hmm. and sort of titrated by the therapist. And if it doesn't feel right, you know, another therapist is, is the answer not to quit therapy altogether, mm-hmm. I would say. Mm-hmm. And as far as, you know, I do believe medication can be really helpful to some people when it's kind of appropriate. And then we could talk at length about that. But I, I do believe it's helpful to some people. And especially when they've tried everything else, it can be 
be really invalidating to say just exercise more when someone's doing that. Yeah. Um, or they can't. Or get when off someone's the couch. anxious and they're like, "Oh, smell lavender." Yeah. Yeah. It's right. Like, it, it's like your house is on fire. Have you considered spraying it with a hose? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's really invalidating when someone, mm. yeah, for example, is so depressed they can't literally get out of bed and take a shower, and someone's like, "You should run." It's like, are you kidding me? Yeah. yeah. You tried St. John's Wort. Yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> that's not helpful. So I think you know, at some point, sort of considering medication and the other forms of treatment for mental health out there now, which include TMS, which is transcranial magnetic stimulation. And, you know, there are a bunch of other things kind of coming out, potentially psilocybin and psychedelics in the in the coming years, but ketamine right now, FDA approved. So I think in a general sense, I kind of espouse all those things and kind of also stress reduction. So I see a lot of people that come in and they have a terrible boss or they have a terrible toxic relationship and that alone can yeah, like cause depression. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's I mean, it's good to have community too. I guess that that's a good way of ending with you know this idea that it really is protective to against depression to have a community. And so for people who don't have anything, and plenty of people are alone, so there's nothing wrong with that. If some people have no friends, no family, no community, but it's now possible to get community. So you can yep. go to a meetup and meet people for Scrabble, or you can mm-hmm. go to your local church even if you don't really believe the religion. And twelve step programs, twelve step Al Anon. A million, well, which is a 12 step, yeah. but yeah, there's something for everyone there actually. And it's free and you just need to kind of find it. But even if that's, if someone's in an area that doesn't have something geographically accessible, sure, going to find an online community is an option as well. And that community and vulnerability mm-hmm. does breed connection and it also is protective against men- mental health issues. Mm-hmm. And and one thing I learned again in 12 step programs that didn't make sense to me at first, but then I believe it wholeheartedly now, which is self care and showing up and being honest are forms of service. So one of the things that can be incredibly helpful is like, even if like if we don't value ourselves, even if we don't want to necessarily practice self-care, it's a way to help other people. Like being honest about what we're going through, it's one of the greatest forms of service to someone else. I'm sure you've experienced this countless times where like, expressing yourself honestly, talking about what you're going through can be so empowering for other people because then they're like, oh, I guess now I'm allowed to express myself. Mm -hmm. And I personally find like when in doubt, try and help someone else when Mm -hmm. like nothing for me is as powerful as just reminding myself to try and be of service. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if someone's in the depths of depression or anxiety, service might not be the first thing that comes to mind. But in terms of sustaining well-being, I personally find service to be that just the ethos of service to be so incredibly important. Yeah. And it's sort of like the the oxygen mask on an airplane, right? You have to take care of yourself and make sure you're okay. And then once you do that, you're capable of sort of putting the mask on someone next to you or helping other people too. Yeah. So that's, I mean, I, I obviously could talk for the next 17 hours, but... I know, I could too. too. But Lynn's, I Lynn's, like... Lynn's, Lynn's, what, do you, what else you got? No, I think this feels like a really good spot unless there's anything else or if you have like a social media or anything like that. Yeah, so sure. So I'm so my company, Remedy Psychiatry, sees patients in California soon to move to Washington, but that's remedypsychiatry.com where we can see patients locally for medication. Um, but we have one of our goals is democratization of education that's accurate through social mm-hmm. media. So we have a Facebook page, we have an Instagram page, and we have a TikTok page. For Remedy. Yes. For remedy, and I think so. It's all called remedy. Remedy psychiatry is our full name, and I think okay. the handle is like remedy psychiatry. Actually, my TikTok is Dr. Kirsten Thompson, and that's been great because I give all sort of research-based information, and it's been really fun. I, you know, did video like a video on PMDD, which is premenstrual dysphoric disorder, and which is severe depression each month with a woman's menstrual cycle. And somebody saw the video and came back and said like. I realized I had this and I got help and I'm so much better. And so for that one person who had like a free morsel of information and then felt better, I think getting accurate information through TikTok from doctors or people Mm -hmm. who are trained can be amazing and priceless. And so that's one of our goals as well, in addition to reducing the stigma around mental health in general, which means kind of talking about it and which is why I'm really grateful to to be talking about it with you today. That's amazing. Okay. I'm going to give those a follow. (laughs) I can't wait. I'm excited. Great. Thank you so 
much. I think both Lindsay and I are incredibly grateful. I am wrestling with my guilt because we've kept you here for such a long time. It's my pleasure. I could talk about this stuff for hours. Very (laughs) passionate about it. Boy, oh boy, this has been wonderful. And I'm just over the moon and so excited that you were able to come over and talk with us for such a long time. Me too. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I love talking about this and really just making hopefully anybody listening feel like they're worthy of getting help and they should. So um, one of my goals in life. So thank you for the invitation. So I don't know about you, Lindsay, but I thought that was amazing. It's weird how talking about the struggles that we all share makes me feel so much better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it just makes me feel like, okay, not only are we, the three of us, not alone in our struggles, but it's so common and it's such a shared experience to have these issues. It just, it, there's so much like, I get such a calming feeling out of that, of the not aloneness, you know? I mean, I had this experience and some of my epiphanies are very basic and self-evident, but it was about, I guess, 10 years ago, I was... I was DJing at Coachella, Mm -hmm. and I don't even know how to pronounce Coachella. I've played there twice, and I should know how to pronounce it, but Coachella, Coachella. Coachella. So I was DJing at Coachella, and I was driving to Coachella on the 10, which is one of the ugliest roads that humans have ever invented. (laughs) Like, it was a hot day, and I was driving through some ugly part of Southern California, and the traffic was terrible. And I had this moment, I was so unhappy. I was like, oh, I hate this traffic. I hate this. It's so terrible. It's going to be four or five hours to get there. And I suddenly realized, I looked around and I was like, oh, I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. Everybody hates this traffic. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a good chance people hate it way more than I do because there's a good chance people are like coming from a job that they hate, going to a home that they don't feel safe in. And all of a sudden, I felt this sense of solidarity, to your point, of we're all dealing with the same things. We're all, we're all struggling. We're, I mean, look at, like, if, if, I mean, some people, based on, like, their socioeconomic status, struggle more, struggle less. But still, it's the human condition to struggle. And you're right. It's so comforting and empowering, in a way, to not feel alone in our struggle. So I hope, for the people who are listening, I hope that somehow you've been helped by what we've talked about and that you feel less alone if you're struggling and maybe even more empowered to go out and try and, you know, to reach out and get help. Because you're valuable and worth it and cool. And then maybe you smell nice. I don't. Well. You're not talking to me. You're talking to someone listening. Yeah, I'm talking I, to someone listening. Because I, I do not <laughs> smell very nice. There's a, there's a good reason I don't date. I'm just saying that you have value and that is a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for listening. Yeah, I want to say goodbye, but I also want to say thank you to Jonathan Nezvadba, who edits this podcast like a beast. I also want to say thanks to Human Content, who helps us to get this podcast out into the world at large. And I also want to say thanks to Bagel, who was a really good dog during that. Yeah, (laughs) Um, and at the end of the episode, Bagel played one of her favorite games, which is the pirate crawl game, or the pirate crawl? I don't know. It's like an army crawl kind of thing. Yeah, she does this crawl with her little breastbone, her vegan breastbone in her mouth, and she crawls across the floor, and it's the most adorable thing I've ever seen. Yeah, so thank you, Bagel, for that, and thank you for listening. If you're still here, you're one of the real ones, and (laughs) boy, do I love you. All right, see you in two weeks. Bye. 